This week on The Laura Flanders Show, can Americans learn about digital security from Dalit activists with experience in India? We'll find out and bring you some tech tips that you can use. All that and a few thoughts from me on the Trump campaign against the courts. It may not be as madcap as you think. It's all coming up right here on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. The Trump administration is taking office at a critical juncture. Eight years of Bush followed by eight years of Obama have settled nothing in the debate over our personal freedoms or the length government can go to monitor, gather and intervene in our lives. But they have set up an enormous surveillance state. The FBI, the National Security Administration, the CIA are all the most powerful they've ever been. And that's the state that the Trump team are inheriting a team that has next to no experience in government, but lots of experience in on and offline bullying. The combination has lots of people worried. Already there is a rush to sign up for email encryption services and a spike in downloads for encrypted messaging tools. What are journalists, activists, and ordinary Americans to do? Well, we talk a lot on this program about the need to communicate more, not less, and with people we don't know, to talk with open hearts and gather information from un unfamiliar places. So how do you do that in an era of surveillance and state control? And what happens to storytelling in a time of mass communications fears? Our next guest is a transmedia storyteller, technologist, and journalist who believes that story is the most important unit of social change. Her work's been recognized by the Producers Guild of America Diversity Program, the Museum of Contemporary Art, the MIT Center for New Media Studies, and many more. Denmori Soundararajan is executive director of Equality Labs and one of the first Dalit women online. After the attacks on the U.S. of 9-11, she founded the first Women of Color Media and Tech Lab, she says. Then, Maury, welcome to the program. Welcome back, I should say. <laughs> Thank you for having me, You know, Laura. your face may look familiar because people who watch this program re regularly will have seen you not so long ago on a panel about violence against women, state violence, family violence, mm -hmm. um, police violence. What brings you, an activist against violence, against Dalit women especially, into this place, a conversation about surveillance and state control? Well, I think that it's actually a very, unfortunately, natural progression. Whenever you see state control you see, and state violence, you see that the mechanisms of control translate to many different kinds of platforms. So the bullying that we see on the streets translates to bullying online. Mm. The surveillance and stalking that we see in the streets translates to surveillance and stalking online. And frankly, I think, you know, when you work on an issue where you're calling out one of the biggest black human rights actors in the world, the Indian government, you are going to be surveilled by the Indian government. And, you know, I think that you can't talk about the, the power of what it is to speak out without understanding some of the consequences given mass surveillance in our societies today. Now, you've already touched on it. You work internationally. Absolutely. Um, for our audience here, talk about what you see coming down the pike in this moment. Well, I think what's interesting is, is that when we talk about surveillance and being a U.S.-based organizer, um, we are now living in one of the largest surveilled um, times of our lives. And I think, you know, there's been a creep around the loss of our right to privacy that, you know, initially the conversation most people had was, well, I have nothing to hide. That's right. I have nothing to hide. So if this helps people get, quote unquote, terrorists, then, um, you know, let me give a little bit of my privacy in order to be a little bit more free, not realizing this is a devil's bargain, you know. And, you know, and unfortunately, as you mentioned in your intro, the CIA, the NSA, and our local police departments are coordinating surveillance in a way that they've never done before and are tracking, at, at, tracking us in a way that's unprecedented. And what do we know about the Trump team's approach to all of this? 
Well, you know, of course, you know, we're in this process right now of um, waiting to see how the cabinet fills out. But we know just even from his initial announcement, like he has Giuliani as a director of cybersecurity. Rudolph Rudy, Rudy <laughs> Giuliani, former mayor of New York. Yes, and I think in that capacity um, really was responsible for some of the most regressive surveillance policies piloted in New York that, you know, became adopted by many cities across the country. You know, under him, he put William Bratton, the head of the NYPD, he put into policies that led to stop and frisk, you know, which we know has led to the, you know, the decline of relationships between people of color and policing, police institutions. But also he did something very interesting um, right before 9-11. He created something called um, the demographic unit, uh, which later became the zone assessment unit which basically surveilled every single mosque in a hundred mile radius of New York City. And that included sending people to be um, uh, surveillance operators within mosques, and it, they surveilled communications as well as the actual geographic locations of community centers, community businesses, and even people's homes. So what you were describing so far has more in my mind to do with policing, they call it law enforcement, but policing than cyber technology and online surveillance. How do you see that part of this picture shaping up? Well, I think this is a really important point because I think when most people think about surveillance, they think it really rose like with the rise of technology, that somehow when we started to carry devices, we became more unsafe with regard to our right to privacy. And we didn't? No. I mean, we've got to have like a whole reframe and understand that surveillance was always part of state violence and the U.S. settler colonial state. So what I mean by that is, is that even though we have the right to privacy guaranteed in our Constitution, that only guarantees it for those that were white, mm -hmm. male, and cis. If you were black, if you were indigenous, you were surveilled very heavily by the, colon the, the colonial administration that eventually became our government. So for example, in New York City, um, in 1713, they passed this law called the Lantern Law. Have you heard of this? Mm -mm. So during that time, because they were afraid of people mobilizing in the dark to resist um, slavery, they would, anyone who was black and indigenous and over the age of 14 had to carry a lantern. <laughs> And if you didn't carry a lantern while you were walking, you could be subjected to 40 lashes by your master and worse. And that idea was, at that time, that was the technology of the moment, you know? And it's the forerunner of what we see now when you go into, um, you know, black and brown communities in New York City where they do those massive lights and you can't focus because they're so bright. Anytime there's been a shift in technology, we've seen it turned in a way to be able to, mm. to manufacture control of the state of our, our lives. And at the very same time, there's a consumer strategy too, in the sense that we've been sold that carrying our own lantern will make life so much easier. Exactly. I mean, but we have to think about like whether it's the iPhone or whether we're using Google search, the devices and these platforms, they're not really free. We're paying them with our data. Yeah. And what that means is, is like, for example, let's say you're doing a Google search and you're about to go to the Women's March and you search, you know, what are my rights? Where's the location for direct uh, action? You know, how do I do civil disobedience? Just from a set of questions of what you put into Google search, you can be put into a database of people that they assume are going to be unlawful actors for that protest. So you don't need to be interrogated. You've already given it away yeah. in your search inquiries. So what do we do? Not search for that information? No, I think what we can do, and the way I talk about it, it's like harm reduction. So we know that these devices are gonna leak data to people that want to do bad things things to us. So we want to be able, and this is the conversation in digital security, is practice harm reduction by using circumvention tools. So things like signal on the phone can really help you protect like your text messages and the way that you talk to people so that you're off of some of the surveillance grid mm -hmm. for folks. You can also use um, DuckDuckGo as an alternative to Google so that you don't create like a data tracked a search engine profile so your searchers are kind of free from Google and Google Analytics. So that's a program that doesn't maintain a history of what you've searched for? Exactly, exactly. Or a cookie? Or a cookie. <laughs> Friendly name for something not so friendly. I know, exactly. Um, and the other thing that I recommend is something like, uh, something to protect your network access. So right now, if you go to Starbucks or if you go to um, a Wi-Fi network in an organization, you're, when you're connecting to the internet, you're connecting to the internet in the wide open. What you need is something like a condom to protect your access 
access so that none of your data leaks. So to protect your network access or give yourself that condom, um, one of the things that we recommend is something called a virtual private network mm -hmm. um, or using something like Tor. So I think that combination of using Signal, using a VPN to protect your network access, and then being able to use DuckDuckGo to anonymize your searches helps you be able to begin to start to take back some of your digital security. So half of my audience, I'm sure, is thinking, OK, now she just lost me. Um, <laughs> but the other half is saying, well, this is rudimentary and everybody should know. What's the truth about how tech savvy you need to be to do any of these things? Well, again, um, I don't think you need to be tech savvy at all. Many of these things don't require a lot of um, technical knowledge. They just require patience um, and also a collaborative community to help you understand what you don't know mm -hmm. and to help you get to that point. And I think that's a big part of the work that we do in Equality Labs. Like we are a woman of color, um, gender non-conforming, trans-centered tech collective that really looks at saying that anyone can start to begin to protect themselves and that self-defense really begins with community. This is not something where we can protect ourselves just one at a time. We really need to have a community coordinated self-defense. And a lot of that means centering not the technology, but centering our community mm. conversations and our power together. Can you tell me a little bit more about what the lab has discovered in terms of what people are going through? Examples, maybe? Well, we did a series of rapid response trainings all throughout the country right after the Trump administration. And I think one of the things that was really alarming was that there was a lot of widespread paranoia and a sense that people felt very disempowered about how to be able to start to create some very common sense measures related how to deal with um, state surveillance, but also that most of the groups that are the most vulnerable are the most vulnerable also because of capacity. You know, most people are using Google Docs and are keeping their databases and Google servers because they don't have the money for paid services, you know, or they don't know that there are ways to protect your network access by getting a paid VPN versus like a free VPN or you know what have you so I think part of it is just being able to provide compassionate very rationed information at a time when there's a lot of disinformation um, but also you know we've lived through massive surveillance in our communities before this is what the heart of COINTELPRO was and so I think this is also another really important piece is that I think sometimes in intergenerational dialogues around surveillance people feel especially like parents like my mom's generation feel like I don't have a place at the table because I don't even know how to really understand Facebook like my mom's always like what's up what is that how do I do that um, but I actually think that elders offer a really critical understanding of how to understand um, how to move around a violent state apparatus because we they lived through the attacks on yes Cointel, exactly exactly like and and strategies people used like you know whether it was like flags on buildings code words phone trees all of that knowledge we need to bring back into our movements and we need to bring them back now the equality lab has done us all the favor of coming up with a curriculum to help us make sense of some of this can you tell me a bit about what's in it? Yes, so this curriculum was really a labor of love by women around the country to really look at the ways that we could create a curriculum that centered ourselves, our self-care, and our self-defense when it comes to operating in online spaces. And it looks very specifically at how you can secure your devices, secure your communications, secure your network access, as well as secure your social networking. So I think that most people, when they start to get into digital security, it starts to feel really overwhelming and you don't know which conduit to go in. So we, we worked with a graphic artist to really be able to center ourselves within it. So you see a lot of illustrations of women using technology, um, but also uh, to really provide easy inroads to each of those different areas so that people, when they walk away, feel really empowered and they start to be able to use the curriculum to have these conversations in their community organizing networks and in their communities that they're from. All right, so let's take a look.
how can people get that curriculum? It's fantastic. So the curriculum is available online at our website at equalitylabs.org, and we'll also give you guys a downloadable copy through this segment, so people can download that as well as quick tip sheets that they can share within their groups. That's fantastic. Let's talk to the other side of this for a minute. People have real fears about subversive activity and terror attacks. Um, and Donald Trump has proven himself very good at plugging into those, whether it was the San Bernardino attack or the uh, shooting in Orlando. He's talked about how our constraints on the FBI and how our corporate resistance to collaborating with government, he went off to Apple, um, have led to people dying, have led to attacks like this. How do you intervene in that discourse, which, you know, it's a big mix of people who have those fears? Well, first of all, I think that's hyperbole. I don't, I absolutely disagree that the response to terrorism is greater surveillance. But also, I think what's at stake is really who do we want to be as a country moving forward? Um, and my sense is, is that when you jeopardize the right to privacy, you jeopardize the right to assembly, and the je you jeopardize the right to free speech. Those three rights are the core of who we are as a democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think we can't afford that risk, especially at a time right now, to, to not be able to have those pillars strong and functioning. And right now, the right to privacy is extremely, extremely anemic, given the, the way that it's been eroded, not just by policy, but also by the corporations frankly. And I think this is why the work of self-defense and looking at digital security as an important way that we kind of gird all of our movements across the board is one of the ways that we can make sure that we can organize safely through this next administration. But just to push you just slightly, what if you're not in an organization, you're not in a movement, you're not getting a whole lot of education, and maybe you don't have a big feeling about the nature of the state. You're just scared there'll be an attack on your school. And you're thinking, let the FBI do what they want. I think that um, it's a very short-sighted position to have because you don't know what's going to be used against you when and where and why. So let's say that you're a mother in Kansas who feels that position, um, but you have a child that is... I know um, people in Brooklyn who feel that way. Yeah, okay, let's say, <laughs> let's say you ha you're someone who um, is a mother in Brooklyn who feels that way. You don't know what are the layers of connection you might have to someone that might be vulnerable through a sting like this. But also, when they have that data, they don't just have that data for that moment. They have that data for an entirety of your life. Yeah. And you don't know when it might be used against you, when it might be used against your child, when it might be used against someone that you know. There is no parameters about how this data can be used against you whenever. So it's, it's, it's not something that's theoretical that we have to, to look at. It is actually something that's functional right now. Now, as you said at the beginning, and I'd love us to end there, these are not brand new times, although we may have brand new tools and technology that we're dealing with. Talk a little bit about how you navigate all of this. You travel across borders. You work with a variety of people. You're trying to build broader, not narrower movements. And you know this information about the tech tools that exist for state control. How do you operate? How do you, what's your strategy in this time? For me, I think that, you know, the core of my strategy starts with self-care and compassion because, like I said, meeting so many people, um, there is this clear sense of grief and this clear sense of anxiety when dealing with the threats that come out of mass surveillance and, um, you know, and state violence that's connected to that. So I, I try to just ground myself one day at a time and then have compassion for the fact that we're, we're actually very rational to have this sense of anxiety. We're very rational to have this deep fear because it is frightening. We've seen people's lives utterly destroyed and taken away when these tools are implemented against people. So um, in knowing that, I think that our best defense is actually each other. Our best defense is caring for each other. Our best defense is knowing that we're going to fight, but fight with joy. And the sense that we are on the right side mm -hmm. and that we, um, that we will win is there but we just have to be able to tap into the joy that will allow us to pass through this very dark period. Is there one story or, or one person's experience that focused you to focus on this issue, to concentrate on this issue of surveillance and that aspect of state control? 
Well, for me, the reason why I entered surveillance um, and the and the digital privacy issue so strongly was actually myself and my team were hacked. Um, we were just about to do um, a massive tour of Dalit women who were talking about sexual violence, and an hour before our guests were um, to arrive, um, we were attacked by Hindu fundamentalists. They attacked our phones, they attacked our computers, and one of my staff members was directly targeted because she was an immigrant, and they masqueraded as an immigration officer, and they told her she was in violation of her visa and she was going to be picked up right away. And they were pushing her because they wanted personal details as to where she was, because she was going to be deported immediately. And I will never forget the tone of her voice. I will never forget the fear in our organization. And, you know, eventually we worked with a security consultant who helped us kind of rectify our comms and identify the actor, which was a soft actor of um, the Indian state, and they were Hindu fundamentalists. But knowing the vulnerability, knowing that they went after us because we were women, knowing that they went after someone who was immigrant and was scared within our team, I was just so mad. And then I also was um, very clear that I couldn't just think of a solution that would only help us and only help me. We, I, if, if we were targeted in this way, how many other canaries in the coal mine were also going to be equally vulnerable? And with that, that was really the impetus for Equality Labs, like large-scale digital security initiatives saying, no, as women of color, gender non-conforming trans people, we are not going to go back in the shadows. We are going to fight but we're gonna fight strategically and we're gonna bring all of our people safely on the other side. And, and that to me is really how we carry each other's water. Just because we're vulnerable doesn't mean that um, uh, our vulnerability is unique to us. The state will find all communities that it wants to destroy in the way of its extractive, violent policies that it wants to push forth. But the message that we have to the predator in chief is look, we are not going anywhere. We are staying here and we're gonna organize safely as we resist. Demory, thank you so much for being with us. Always great to talk with you. Yes, thank you. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show. More information at our website. You can find out more about Equality Labs and find all of our video explainers on digital security at our website. That's lauraflanders.com. Journalists, Democrats, immigrants, women, African Americans, to the long list of people our new president doesn't seem to like very much, Donald Trump recently doubled down on judges. His undisciplined assaults on the bench have liberals shocked and dismayed, but there may be some method in this particular madness. Judges and courts sit at the top of the GOP hit list. Just cannot believe a judge would put our country in such peril, Donald Trump tweeted after the suspension of his immigration ban was upheld on appeal, describing as a so-called judge the guy who'd suspended that ban in the first place. After that, POTUS went one step further, targeting not just the person, but the process. Quote, if something happens, blame him and court system, he tweeted. Now, it is true that the Donald brings to judge hate his own particular prowess. As a candidate, remember, he asserted that the judge presiding over a fraud lawsuit brought by former students of Trump University had a conflict of interest because his family was of Mexican heritage. His actual word was Spanish. It's taking things up a notch to go after the courts with the power of the presidency, but discrediting the bench is nothing new. Disparaging judges and their decisions on potentially profit-costing things like consumer protections, climate preservation, and civil rights has long been GOP policy. Activist judges, Republicans blame, for just about every lost profit or power they've ever suffered. The RNC platform itself says all sorts of horrible things about the court's decisions on marriage and choice. And then it goes on to urge Congress to, quote, use the check of impeachment for judges. President Trump's leading with his chin, you might say, and getting plenty of establishment flack for it, but he is hardly a rogue boxer in this controversy. On the contrary, he's softening up a target the Republicans have long wanted to whack, and just in time for Supreme Court confirmation hearings. Mm -hmm.